presence of God, who holds the keys of life and death. We meet to remember the life of Mark Benedict Bevis, who has died, to give thanks, to forgive, and to look forward. We meet to commit Mark and ourselves to God, whose son Jesus has passed through death before us. So hear now words of faith and hope. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. So welcome to Bloomsbury for this occasion to meet, to remember, to give thanks and to grieve. My name is Simon, I'm the minister here at Bloomsbury and I welcome you in the name of the fellowship here. We're going to begin our time together by singing the hymn, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy. Please stand as you are able and we will sing together. Let us pray. Loving God, who is like father and mother to us all, your love is stronger than death, and by you we are all being brought to life. 
Help us as we hear the promises of your word to receive the comfort they offer. All living things find their source and destination in you. And we thank you for giving us this world and all that lives in it. For all that gives us so much joy in life. We thank you for our friends and families. For those we have lost and those who are still part of our lives. We especially give you thanks today for Mark and for the life he has lived before you. We remember with gratitude all that he has been to us and to so many others. As we contemplate our own continuing lives, give us courage and comfort to face the future with you knowing that in your great love all the threads of this world are gathered together. We confess to you our regrets. We acknowledge what is past. In this moment, give us grace to receive and to offer forgiveness. You are the giver of hope. So give us peace, that our fears may be dispelled, our loneliness eased and our hope reawakened. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'd like to ask Judith to come up and bring us our first reading. The first reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 32 to 40 and 46. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on the right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then the righteous will to internal life. I'd like you to, to invite you to observe a few moments of silent remembrance, an opportunity for us all to bring to mind our own special memories. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. The choir are going to lead us now in John Rutter's setting of the Lord bless you and keep you. And this is going to be introduced for us in both English and Spanish.
So this is um, a prayer that was used at Mark's funeral in Bogota. El coro va a cantar la versión de John Rutter de una oración del funeral de Mark. I don't know where, which way is the, can I look straight at the camera? Which way do I look? This one? Queridas Miriam, Diana y Dani, el Señor les bendiga y les guarde. Amen. So we're coming to that point in our service where we're going to hear a number of different tributes and remembrances. Uh, so first we're going to be hearing from Nick. Now Nick is here in the building or is he online? He's online. Okay, Matthew, do we have Nick available to share? This is t Please do, yes, yeah, so we'll need to promote him to panelists to allow him to share his video and audio. So this is Nick Perkins. Nick, if you're hearing this, uh, we'll have you with us in just a moment. Hello. Right, Nick, we can hear you, and in a moment, we can also see you. Nick, it's good to have you with us. Over to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I, just a few words before I, I read what I plan to read. I, I first met Mark, or Max, as he's known here. I'll, I'll call him Max, because that's what we all called him. Uh, that would have been in the in the mid noughties he came into my office for a job interview. Um, I knew within minutes that I was going to hire him and I knew within days that we'd become friends. 
uh, not least of which because of our common interest in always questioning the accepted way of doing things. And over the years, uh, that was a, a common theme in our friendship. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this service. I was um, fortunate enough to be able to attend the service in, in Bogota as well. And um, it's nice to be able to be here with you as well. Um, as I was thinking about what to read at the service, um, a friend, a mutual friend who now lives in Australia, um, sent some words to another mutual friend, Jill, uh, who lives here in Colombia. And Jill and I looked at, at what he'd sent, and neither of us could think of anything uh, that would be any better uh, than Mark's words. Mark is actually an author. Um, so I will read his words now, first in English and then uh, in Spanish, as we did in the service in Bogota. You always think you're going to have time. The, the day will definitely come when you catch up for that long overdue drink. Instead, I'm sitting here by myself with two beers, one for Max and one for me, thinking back to the times that we shared. To be fair, most of them did involve a couple of beers, good times too, and laughter. Max's laughter, Max's sense of humour was one of the things I loved most about him. Okay, not so much the dad jokes, but those quick fire, smart ass remarks always got to me. And he could pull them off because underneath it all, you felt the kindness. The kindness is what I most remember about Max, a top bloke, a solid friend, a father who gave his all. I'm grateful for the times that we shared, but mostly I'm still struggling with the fact that we can't share anymore. Goodbye, mate. You are already deeply missed. Uno siempre cree que va a tener más tiempo, que seguramente llegará el día para tomarse el trago que dejamos pendiente. En lugar de esto, estoy aquí, sentado solo, con dos cervezas, una para mí y otra para Max, pensando en todos los buenos momentos que compartimos. Y en realidad la mayoría de estos momentos los acompañamos con un par de cervezas, y fueron buenos tiempos, con risas. El sentido de humor de Max fue una de las cosas que más me gustaba de él. Bueno, no tanto los chistes cursis, chistes de papá, como decimos en inglés, sino los comentarios inteligentes pero burlones. Siempre me hacían reír. Y él lo lograba porque debajo de todo corría su fuerte sentido de bondad y ternura. Esa bondad y ternura son de hecho lo que más recuerdo de Max. Un tipazo, un amigo del alma, y un papá totalmente dedicado. Estoy muy agradecido por los momentos que compartimos, pero sobre todo, estoy luchando con el hecho de que ya no podremos compartir más. Adiós, amigo. Se te extraña mucho ya. Thank you. Nick, thank you for that. So I'm going to invite Sam to come up now. I'll admit I struggled to find the words for this speech, not just because I was a little stuck on what to say, but because, in fact, there's probably a lot more than I could say, but because it's university exam season and I have a lot going on, uh, but that's pretty classic, classic Mark. Uh, he can never do anything on time that was convenient for the rest of us, um, <laughs> but we loved him for it. And I decided that I really wanted to talk about the time I spent with Mark recently. Uh, the, the closest we ever were when I was, I was staying with him. But I need to put that into context first. I grew up the first 11 years of my life with Mark living in Colombia. I was very used to it. So when he announced in 2019 that he was moving back over there, it was shocking for my cousins and all the little ones in the audience that he wasn't going to be around the corner anymore. But for me, that was okay because I was used to it. I was used to him not being present. However, it's going to take far longer for me to use to him not being around. So in May, in May this year, I had the freedom to go to Colombia because uh, I wanted to travel and I wanted to see Danny. Uh, and I was living with Mark in his and Danny's little two-bedroom flat. Um, Danny kindly let me have a room, bless him. Um, and I got very used to living with him. It had many of the same quirks I experience with my flatmates up at university. We wake up and go to sleep at different times. We get hungry at different times. Lots of, lots of little quirks. But we live together very fluidly. 
and I was really hoping that my finances would allow me to go back and stay again. I guess it won't be quite the same this time. Um, but now to what I really wanted to talk about is uh, whilst I was in Bogota, me and Mark went on a lad's holiday uh, <laughs> to, to Visual de Labour where we, was there a oh, presentation, wonderful. Uh, we went on that party bus and got drunk out in the desert and my Spanish is not good and it's even worse when I've had six beers, uh, but thankfully Mark can translate. We made the next one, if whoever's on the, awesome. We made arepas uh, in a hotel inclusive masterclass. Um, the next one doesn't have a photo, you're all good. Uh, we went quad biking and then got really frustrated that the guy leading the tour wouldn't let us go very fast. Um, and then we went out into the desert on, uh, this will be the next one, on a 4x4 four four tour and saw the ostrich farm and these, this photo doesn't do it justice, these incredibly blue pools that sadly you can't swim in anymore. Um, but somewhere there's a photo that Mark took of me up to my knees and I'm holding up my shorts in a very unflattering manner. Um, but if we, we go on next slide. We also spent a few minutes building that, and that is a, is a tiny little rock pile. Um, and I didn't think about much of the time about how special that was. Um, it wasn't, it we, we took us less than five minutes. Uh, but looking back, it was probably my favorite bit. Um, and I can be pretty confident that that rock pile doesn't exist anymore, that, that it was ransacked for other people copying us and the wind and the wildlife. Um, but it's safe and secure in my memory. And just so it stays that way is I'm going to get it tattooed, uh, which Mark would have absolutely hated. Um, but if there's one thing he taught me in life, it was how to bend or break the rules. Um, thank you. Uh, and lastly, there's one more photo of the two of us quad biking. And that one can stay up if you want to leave it up for a bit, because it's nice. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Carl. And I have to follow that? <laughs> wow. Um, I'm Carl. I am Mark's brother. Um, and there was so much I could tell you. I could be here for a long time. Um, but I've brought some of those stories just by bringing all these photographs. So do please take your time to have a look at some of these photographs. And um, it's so nice to know that there are so many friends joining us from overseas and indeed other parts of the UK. So um, uh, Danny, trust me, I've got another full set. I will make sure that all the stories that go with these photographs um, will be yours in time. Some of them are more recent. Um, but you'll see there are some um, where he is a lot younger, um, certainly one somewhere where he's only wearing a hat and scarf, <laughs> but he was only about two, so we'll let him off. Um, and in a moment I'm going to share a piece of poetry that, um, that I've written for him, um, uh, but before then I wanted to, to pick up almost on what Nick was saying about um, how Mark would never quite accept the conventional. Is that fair, Dad? Um, he would do things a little bit differently. And just to make that point, um, a couple of anecdotes, I'll try and keep it quite brief. Um, when we were quite small, mum and dad uh, ran summer schools. Um, and I don't know where this one was particularly, but Mark would have been about two at the time. And he knew that the rule was you don't go out with strangers. The whole stranger danger, that was understood, you don't do that. But he also knew that the groundsman went for a kind of constitutional walk every, every day, probably after lunch, I'm not sure. So Mark went up to this man, I don't know how old this guy was, but probably, you know, in his 60s, whatever, and said, what's your name? And he told him his name. Right, I know your name, we can go for a walk now. <laughs> not a stranger anymore, is he? Once you've shared a name, you know that person. That was my brother. Um, There'll be people here who remember my mum. And this story goes back to when he was probably about four or five, I think. Um, he, we were coming into the month of Christmas, I, I mean, as we are now. And um, he chose the wrong moment to ask mum what she'd like for Christmas. 
Um, my mum was wonderful in so many ways, but catch her at the wrong moment and she properly had it, you know, sort of, she went for him. I'm sure there are people in the audience who can, who can recognise that quality. And he asked her what she'd like for Christmas, and she said, I'd like some peace and quiet. <laughs> okay. And in this gorgeous five-year-old's way, he found an empty cereal packet, and he wrapped it, so he covered it in in paper and then with his little five-year-old hands he reached inside with different coloring pens and wrote shh be quiet and he gave her a box of peace and quiet for Christmas <laughs> now if that's not defying the convention I'm not sure what is and this last story much more recent, somewhere up here is, is a photograph of all the medals he's um, atta ascertained, attained um, with, um, with running marathons. Um, and he was quite the runner. I know he got my sister into running, he dragged me out occasionally. Um, but recently, he was raising awareness of breast cancer in men. And we've all been hassled for sponsorship at times. We all know what it is to, you know, to have to put some money in the, t in, the, in the pot or whatever. But Mark was raising awareness. He wasn't actually worried about the funds. And he wanted to gather men. He wanted a commitment from as many men as he was going to run miles to commit to say, yeah, okay, I will check myself. Blokes, you know, it happens. Do check yourself. And so his number plate that he ran in was surrounded by the names of blokes. Some of you will be in this room. That he'd asked them to commit to something slightly different. And he ran for them. And I have friends who I've, I've re re you know, explained this story to, and they've gone, yeah, that was me. And whilst you know, that 10 or 20 quid might get forgotten, he made them do it slightly differently. He looked at the world in a slightly different way. Sometimes a really peculiar way, which we might all question, but he just had a way of looking at things slightly differently. Juliet, can I get a sip of water? And, as, and Simon asked us to take a moment to remember those special times. And I did, thank you, but so many special times flashed before my eyes. And it's some of those special times that I tried to capture in this poem. Um, I'm sure whether it's to do with Mark having departed so suddenly, way too early, or any other grief that we've experienced, there's that sense of a hole in my chest. And when I feel a bit overwhelmed, it's really quite difficult to breathe. And so this is about trying to take that moment. I need to breathe. I need to catch my breath. My wife hears me huff and sigh, and she knows full well why I sigh, I am trying to catch my breath. In shock as I am at your death, I fail to find my breath. And I know I dropped that in unexpectedly, surprisingly, in the midst of a poem about the need to breathe. But you did that too. Out of nowhere, you spoiled my Tuesday. You upset my November. Left as I am to remember your face, your laugh, the way you could hug me like a bear and I could not let go. And yet now I must. I must let go and simply hold on to the memories, the stories, some tales perhaps left unspoken, the spell unbroken, the charm you had, that cheeky forever smile, all the while hatching another wicked plan 
And now here I am, catching my breath. So for every car you drove me in, every awkward situation you dropped me in, every fart joke, every time you spoke in colloquial Colombian Spanish or in what you thought passed as English, for every Motown or scar tune we danced to, every harebrained scheme that you might or might not see through, every stupid thing you made me do, every Mackie D's drive through every box of silence you gifted mum, every iddy adventure you shared with Eva and Gum, every young'un that climbed all over you, every niece, every nephew. I will sigh, I will huff, I will find my breath and remember you. For every late night meme, every one of Pharaoh's prophetic dreams, every visit to Stratford with those nylon sheets, every cheer from the side of Danny's football game, every sibling squabble and Mickey taking name, every bike ride, every new passion, every collected road sign, every 80s fashion, every time you took the time to check in on a friend, a Judith or a Travis, a Gavin, a Ross, for every time you made me a little bit cross, Every Guinness, every sledging risk on Somerset snow, every 5k run when I didn't really want to go. For every one of these, for every one you leave, I will breathe. I will feel that cold, sharp reminder of every life you touched. We'll call you Max, we'll call you Mark, we'll call you because we loved you so very much. But we need to breathe. We need to feel allowed to feel proud of how hard we grieve. And we will fill that aching hole in our chest with every story, every breath. Mark, I am told, was once declared by an RE teacher at school as being on the side of the angels. It's not entirely clear whether the angels always appreciated the full benefits of this alliance. <laughs> but certainly they continued to smile on him through his life. A smile he reflected back at the world as a cheeky grin that gave him permission to get away with almost anything. Mark was blessed with many things, energy, good humor, compassion, friends, and family. It's hard to think that a man could want for more. Those who loved him and whom he loved spanned the globe and it is testimony to the wide reach of his personality that we have so many people joining us today, not just here in person on, in London, but online from Colombia, and it wouldn't surprise me, other places too. And we particularly hold today in our thoughts those in Mark's family. We think of Danny and Deanna, Miriam and Hector, Keith and Jenny, Katie and Alan, Millie and Thomas, Carl and Juliet, and Sam and Hepzibah. We made a point of trying to start on time today, something which I'm sure would have appealed to Mark's sense of humor. He was notorious for turning up late for almost everything, including on one occasion, I am told, being outrageously late for dinner with Carl's in-laws, only to then charm his way out of it with a Nerf gun and some inappropriate humor. <laughs> he could charm the birds from the trees in a proper North London geezer sort of way. 
and many years ago found himself managing the Kentish Town branch of McDonald's, where the clientele, let's face it, aren't exactly librarians. But in that context, he managed to set up the first ever regular work placement for someone with Down syndrome. Mark was always looking out for everyone around him, seeking to act in care and compassion for the underdog, for the person in need, so much so that as he drove around Colombia, he would know the names of people begging at traffic lights. And it wasn't unknown for him to have a spare pair of jeans or similar in the boot of his car so that he could hand them out. This passion for compassion found early expression as Mark's best friend from primary school, Idris, had muscular dystrophy. Idris lived to nearly his 18th birthday, but everyone knew he had been on borrowed time for a while. And his, this early experience of the fragility of life shaped Mark to be better able to be alongside and relate to people who had difficulties. When Mark and Idris were 16, they went sailing on the Lord Nelson with people who were both able-bodied and disabled, and Mark looked after his friend in every way, including personal care. Later, Idris's parents took him on to Greece on a catamaran, and Mark sailed with them from Ipswich to Dover before they then crossed the channel. When they were still at primary school, Idris was uh, able to walk longer than most kids with his condition, but he was still slow. This meant that walking to the library or the swimming pool would have slowed everyone down, so Mark and Idris would leave ten minutes early to give Idris time to make the walk. Mark, ever the opportunist, would put Idris in a fireman's lift and race down there with him over his shoulder. They would then get there 10 minutes ahead of everyone else and give themselves a bit of time out. He could play the system like no one else, but would do so with love in his heart. While studying to become a manager at McDonald's, Mark met Deanna and went out to Columbia with her, and their daughter Danny was born. In Colombia, he found a job teaching English as a second language at university and worked, amongst others, with Cambridge University Press, meaning that there was one week in time when all three Bevis children were all working for Cambridge University. Mark not only taught English, but he taught teachers to teach English. And his methods were responsible for reaching thousands of children across South and Central America and further afield too. He would work two days back to back and to coin a family phrase, for someone who was a lazy ass, he was really pretty busy. <laughs> and then of course there were the marathons and the 5Ks and the 10Ks. I was thinking of Mark this morning as I dragged myself out of bed and ran 5k at 7 o'clock in the cold round Southwark Park this morning. He did a London marathon in Bogota during the pandemic. And then there were the cycle rides and the general fitness. Mark came back to the UK in Christmas 2019 working for the British Embassy and then got stuck until September 2020 because of the pandemic and spent this time doing hard labour, helping his friend Ross set up a glamping site. All of these snapshots, things I've said, things others have said, things we said to each other as we were gathering, things we will say to each other in a few minutes. So much that could be said and will be said but we've said enough for this service. Today is a time to remember, to give thanks, to begin the impossible task of letting go by promising to hold on forever. I won't labor any religious platitudes to finish. I'm not sure Mark would appreciate them. 
but I believe with all my heart that God's loving embrace extends beyond death. And that the angels continue to smile on Mark. I'd like to invite Millie to come now and read to us from scripture. Uh, I'm reading from 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18. Our brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad as those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. Thank you, Millie. As we draw our time together in this service to a close, can I invite you to stand again and we will sing the hymn, I danced in the morning, the Lord of the dance.
Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Loving God, we long for peace. Peace to leave Mark with you. Peace to strengthen us for today and tomorrow. Peace with ourselves, with each other and with you. Grant us that peace which the world cannot give, through Jesus Christ your Son. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>